Welcome to Medicine at the Museum with the University of Michigan Museum of Art. In today's installment, we are talking with artist Joanne Leonard. Leonard is an internationally recognized photographer and collage artist and retired distinguished university professor at the University of Michigan's Penny Stamps School of Art and Design. Also joining us is Dave Chaburka, curator for University Learning and Programs at UMA. Many of Leonard's works are in the collection at UMA, including photography and collages centered on the intimate domestic experiences of women. Running through all of Leonard's work is an awareness that the personal is political, and our everyday experiences also speak to larger forces of history. The University of Michigan Museum of Art has multiple pieces in our collection from an ongoing series first created by Leonard in 2015 called Newspaper Diary. These pieces juxtapose daily newspaper clippings with art historical images that connect the past to the present. In this interview, we will discuss this series and how the recent piece, Little Prints and COVID Curves, connects current events surrounding coronavirus to our everyday experiences. Well, hello, I'm Joanne Leonard. I was for many years a professor at School of Art and Design, and I, though I'm retired now, I continue as an artist. Thank you so much for joining us today. And Dave. Hi, I am David Chaburka. I'm the curator for University Learning and Programs at the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Um, one of the things I regularly do in my work is work with university classes and pull out works from our collection to our study room for those classes to discuss. And Joanne's recent works using news images and pairing them with an art historical image or other images, uh, one of my favorite sets of works to use with the students. So nice. So my goal today is to actually ask both of you about your work. We have some of the newspaper diary pieces in the collection, and I know we use them a lot at the UMA um, in the study rooms with students. So I would love to really hear from both of you first, you know, from Joanne about your experience of creating these pieces. And I know you have a new piece that you've made that specifically addresses COVID. Well, I've actually been making the newspaper diary pieces since 2005. And what it involves, people often ask, do you find the art historical images or the newspaper images first? It always starts with the newspaper image. Mm -hmm. that, that's my interest in, and my connection with kind of a, um, I guess, an intention toward a daily practice or a, a frequent practice of responding to things in the world. Um, I'm not so much as I once was out photographing, but... Um, and I've, I've always admired uh, photographs by other people, and 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 maybe that drove me to become a collage artist in addition to being a photographer. So I'm looking for material or things that I respond to, and then I look for something that I might pair them with in this set of collages that, as you described it, pairs. Uh, things from the daily press with something I find in a book often um, an art, mm -hmm. a historical art reproduction. Mm -hmm. And I love, I love this new piece and I recognize the, um, the image that you're uh, pulling from, from The Little Prince. Uh, Joanne, one of the questions I always have when I look at your, your great newspaper diary pieces is, like how quickly, so you start with the news image, how, how quickly does the art historical image or the other image that you're pairing with it, pairing it with come to you? Is it like, is it kind of an instant thing or do you actually have to search or maybe it's like sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other? Well, sometimes one and sometimes the other, but uh, I guess I got a lot of, I keep a lot of things. I think they're just too good to, you know, throw them away. But on the other hand, it's not uncommon that when I see something, the reason I'm attracted to it is that it actually puts something else in my mind that I think, oh, that's so much like this, or I could do this with that. So it's a little of both as you, as, as you um, framed it. Um, 
and no, I have a big stack, so I don't run and do something with everything. Sometimes I don't know what I could do with it. Sometimes I, uh, I think there's a picture that was recently people sweeping or cleaning, but they were all in a kind of regimented rows. And it made me think of the soldier mm -hmm. figures that were buried in China and exhumed. Right. But mm. I couldn't find a picture of it, you know. So it's still that's so still waiting. So well, I, that's interesting. So sometimes it's an image in your head, but you don't know the yeah, actual. Think, yeah. yeah, that would match something I can't find that I'm sure exists right. out there. Right. I have to go to the library, which is you know one thing I do is take my clippings to the library and start looking and and often that leaves me leads me somewhere mm. i had no intention of going but yeah. um, let's see so for example can you Bring see that this the so yes. when yeah. i saw that photograph the small photograph is from the newspaper um and when i saw that i thought those children climbing on bars it reminded me of an abacus uh. so i went looking for some book that might have an abacus and I it's, I found a book about math but the book about math had the illustration about music as a way of dividing up time uh -huh. and then I thought well they look like figures on, on you know notes on a musical staff so it, it turned into something different than what I had imagined but it was my search for my first idea that led me there hmm. so That's fascinating part of my process but I yeah. Yeah. Uh, initially, I had some idea I would get it all from my own shelves, but that that wasn't really possible. That was my imagination. Like you would yeah. see this image, and you'd be like, "Aha! That image in that yeah. book right there on the shelf." That's happened, but, but it happened <laughs> as I'd like. Since I like to stay yeah. home, it drives yeah. me out to the library occasionally. Yeah, that's yeah, that's fascinating to me. That there's kind of an exploratory aspect to your method in producing these because that's one of the things I like most about using them with the students. Is there's kind of a there's a there's there's it's basically sort of presenting the the students with three images there's the newspaper image there's the art historical image and then the combination of the two yeah, yeah. and the and the two in dialogue generates ideas right. like it's not finished it's like it's constantly exploratory it's constantly material that's inviting people to think of new connections right and sometimes there's a bit of a caption uh Though I never want to depend on that because that's not very visual, uh, but the caption might enter in, or even the date might have some importance. Absolutely, also. Mm -hmm. and the date's always in it. Uh, when the there were some exhibited, uh, maybe at the Humanities Institute, and there was a review, and the reviewer said it's neither uh, about newspapers or is it a diary? Mm -hmm. It was kind of in, in like distress. Why did she call it that? And, and it oh, just, and well. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it, there's no newspapers and there's no diary, but I I contend there is. It, it's not diaristic in maybe the most typical sense, and it doesn't happen as often as daily. But it but I do intend it to be kind of a way to register the the days passing. Absolutely. Yeah. I read I read about uh, I think it may have been actually in the foreword of the book that. Um, that you can also you can imagine you sitting at the table looking through the newspaper and you can kind of imagine your cup of coffee there and you just happen to have these you know art historical images there but there's such a uh, rich linking of the inner domestic life and I think in your most recent piece too it's almost like a personal and political that we see in a lot of your work yeah well the story of the of the image with the little prince um, so you see that funny little hump in the uh, a page that was in the New York Times of of uh, graphs. Uh, so that graphs the plateau of the and and the hope for downward curve of the virus uh, in a couple of places. And when I saw that, I thought, oh my gosh, that's looks just like that <laughs> illustration in The Little Prince. And I actually have a copy of The Little Prince. It's a French book, but my copy's in Italian. Uh -huh. And worse, it only had one of those images on the page and the next, and so that the more hat-like one, and then the other image was on the next page. 
So I had to buy an English copy online um, because I can't go to the library. And I was, you know, hell, hell bent for, for making this happen. And so thank gosh, when it came, it had them both. And I could see it online. I looked it up online. I found the illustration and they were always one after under the other, sometimes much more handsomely reproduced with, a little bit of color and things like that but anyway this is what i got by sending for one on amazon mm -hmm. and thank goodness they were on the same page instead of one page after each other so and in this case the visual similarity came to you right away right away and i pursued it right away and that happens especially if i think i have the very book i need mm -hmm. um which i did and didn't in this case it would have been fun if it were in Italian, since my copy was in Italian. But um, so this is in English, mm -hmm. and um, and and there they are. The, 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 uh, and then my niece wrote something about, well, isn't that funny? Because isn't the story about uh, most people can't see this or can't right. see it? Right. And, and, and so it's very charmingly belated. Uh, yeah. For any of our uh, audience who aren't familiar with the book or who maybe it's just been a long time since they've read it, uh, the images there, if you'd like to speak to, you talked about sort of drawing number one as it's referred to in the book and drawing number two. Um, and the little prince um, opens with this sort of description from the narrator around these two images and that he uses these as a litmus test to see if adults are under if grown-ups are understanding you know kind oh, of that's his... perfect recapitulation yes so you have to be perceptive and tuned in and probably not a grown-up uh, to, to see this <laughs> properly and he starts with saying draw me a lamb doesn't he say draw me a lamb or draw yeah me draw a me a sheep yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway it's a conversation about drawing and ineptitude about drawing and so on goes on yeah and I think it's so interesting too because the on one side we have these images that are really I think iconic of a lot of people's childhood um, but then on the other side these images that are parallel but are so terribly adult and uh, and it, just terrible terrible yeah that's yeah. right except uh, could be worse it's a downward curve where we don't even have that yeah mm -hmm. uh, you know another thing that's fascinating about this to me is so the images on the right are graphs of data. They're visualizations of data, right? So data has the, you know, data is about sort of objectivity and rationality and seeing what's mm -hmm. actually there. And there's this idea that, you know, I like the fact that you brought in this kind of adult perspective, Amanda, because it's basically like you have to have like an adult rational perspective to see the graph for what it is. But at the same time, there's people who are questioning data. There's people who are saying these things aren't objective, they're subjective, mm -hmm. right? So, right. so there's something interesting, and then on, and then the thing on the left, like you can't be an adult to actually see what's there. You have to have you have to have the eyes of like childhood fantasy in order yeah. to actually see what's there. Yes. And this the, the the way it puts those sort of rationality and fantasy, childhood and adult mm -hmm. in dialogue with one another is is fascinating. Oh, wonderful! That's wonderful, David. Thank you. I think it's also interesting that both of the images represent risk and danger because oh, you know. Yes. Uh, the boa constrictor swallowing the elephant is what we're seeing, um, you know, from the little prince images and the fact that uh, grown-ups who are not discerning look at an image and see a hat and don't see the risk. Um, whereas, you know, I think, you know, exactly what you were just saying, Dave, that so many people are looking at these graphs and not really understanding the risk and seeing the risk at the same time. Yeah. That's perfect. Um, when did you make this piece? Oh, well, very recently. Um... I guess I don't even know anymore, you know, in terms of two weeks ago or, or something like that. Just, just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, but you say you have in the collection the one, I, I made one about the Ebola or yes. about the Ebola. Um, Got it right here. Perfect. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. It's much yes. more uh, dramatic and art historical mm -hmm. but in that one I just love how the orange that surrounds the or that I guess is actually the color of the stretcher maybe it's leather um, or just orange fabric but it echoes the yellow and orange of the gowns 
of the female mm-hmm. figures below the Christ figure. So they seem so amazingly parallel in, in, the, in a visual way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another example of that that like, has really stood out to me, especially when I see this work in person, is the two men that are standing in the back of the newspaper image with the shovels they're wearing these white masks Mm. and this sort of vertical orientation of their shovels and the white masks reflects the vertical orientation of the crosses in the background the way that the images reflect one another it's yeah yeah, it seems impossible that they're so connected and then similar to the the covid piece this one you know puts these interesting sort of concepts in dialogue of like the you know on the right we have a depiction of Jesus Christ, so a, fi- a figure whose death is con- is like has this world worldwide significance or universal significance, even if we like think of it from the perception of like a, a Christian understanding of the world. The person on the left, they are named, which is interesting. Like if you can actually read the subtitle here, the, the name of this victim is named, but there's still a sense of them being one of many anonymous victims, right? And the sort of singularity of Jesus versus the mass death caused by Ebola is one of the things this makes mm-hmm. me think about. And then this, this emphasis on touching the body in the, in the crucifixion image, as opposed to not being able to touch the body yeah. in an epidemic situation. Those are all just really interesting thoughts that this, that this pairing in this piece brings up. That's just great. And I guess something more could be made. The book is the book of days mm. uh, means but medieval um, manuscript that relates to ideas of calendar, I guess, and, and, and like a newspaper marking time recording history. Right, right. I think something so powerful in your work is the way that you juxtapose the past and the present and that it really disrupts that line of, you know, where you, you start to question, you know, which picture are we in right now? And I know so many people have expressed with the current uh, COVID crisis that, Um, You know, myself, I'm a medical historian and, you know, in my research, I think about, you know, the 14th century and plague pandemic. And so thinking about the real resonance right now today with what people are going through in terms of the loss of life and um, the patterns of how of how spread happens. And so sometimes when I look at your images and I'll see, you know, something that roots us in the past with something that's so present is um, it's really powerful and affecting. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. And we have another piece in the collection um, that I know, Dave, you use a lot in the classroom. It's a Haitian, uh, a couple, there's a Haitian earthquake piece. Yeah. So, uh, so in my work, we, uh, we, we, we try to use the collection of the art museum and the special exhibitions that we happen to have at any time to make really deep connections with the curricula of sort of any number of classes on campus. We work with like, around 400 classes a year. Um, and we try to use the collection in ways that connects to core questions and themes of those classes, um, and to really show how art is is a practice that is it's a it's a pra- it's a form of inquiry. It's a form of engaging with these questions. It's not just examples or you know visual representation that's backing up other ideas. Mm-hmm. They're really they're just really thinking with visual culture. And that's why Joanne's works are are so great for working with these classes because there's an, they're an example of how you actually work with visual culture to. Um, make connections um, between different forms of, or different types of images and to see what sort of themes that they generate and to really let the, you know, let the images speak and tell a story and not just treat them as examples of mm-hmm. other ideas. Um, and so the, the, um, the Haitian earthquake or the, yeah, the Haitian earthquake image that we're looking at right now. And then the Ebola uh, image that we were just looking at are ones that we like to use for a variety of classes that would relate to sort of questions of like really any 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 class that's engaging with questions of sort of social justice and marginalization and sort of visibility. Um, these pieces sort of raise questions of sort of you know who whose deaths are treated as singular, nameable, um, meaningful within a broader culture, and which ones are are sort of you know shuffled off to the side. Mm-hmm. Um, it is insignificant. Um, they're great. The, we use a lot of the images for classes on immigration um, because they raise similar questions about sort of visual representation of who's in and who's out, who are depicted as outsiders, whose stories are worth telling, who's, who's worthy of justice. 
Um, well, that's all a big honor to me to have this, have such important conversations, uh, see work, my work to, to be, so, take part in, in conversations of such value and mm. importance. The, uh, the, the book I found about the Haitian, Haitian art uh, led me to this uh, painting by a Haitian artist, and it depicts um, mm. that American soldiers put this body, they, they intentionally created a tableau that looked uh, religious. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and so, the Haitian artist made the painting based on this photograph. Yeah, Perfect. the name of the name of the man that's depicted in the painting is Peralt. Charlemagne like Peralt. Yeah, so it was during the uh, U.S. occupation of Haiti during World War One. Right. Per Peralt was a leader of an independence movement against the U.S. occupation, and the Marines killed him, and they they propped his body up on a door. Um, and sort of tied him to it and took a photograph of it. And similar to your works, Joanne, that image that they, that they, that, that photograph they took made people think of all the images of the crucifixion that they'd yes. seen before. And it, right? it, it disarmed them in a way or freaked them out and, and helped the, you know, the not very admirable American cause at that moment. Mm. Yeah. But then it also, but it also, you know, it depicts Peralta as a kind of a martyr, as a kind of Jesus yes. figure. So yes. it led to this sort of, you know, it actually helped his cause by um, depicting him as a, a martyr who was unjustly killed by the American occupation. Yeah. 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 So that, but the, the parallels with the crucifixion imagery made, you know, added to his mystique in death mm -hmm. um, and actually promoted the independence movement. Mm. And then your... And then, and then someone like a famous Haitian painter created a painting of the photograph, which hangs in the Haitian National Gallery. And yeah. then there's eerie visual parallels between this newspaper image that you yeah. found. Yeah. And I think in the classroom, what I've seen, you know, students, a, a lot of times the format is there will be, you know, 10 to 15 works of art out and the students will take a few minutes and you know, really engage and look at them and reflect on how these images relate to what they're reading and talking about in class. And then they will choose the images that really resonate for them and share their thoughts. And I can't even tell you how many times I've seen students choose your images. And I think one of the things that speaks to them so viscerally is this question of whose death matters. Um, you have such vivid scenes of tragedy. And the fact that you juxtapose them the way that you do, it sort of shakes us out of our stupor of um, becoming numb to loss of life on such a scale or in certain parts of the world or um, people of color. And I, I just find it incredibly powerful. And even your new image with the, the little prince, you know, and then a line that's showing, you know, the dead. It's showing infection rates, but it's also showing, I think, death rates. Um, it's a very powerful way of helping students, you know, connect um, under things that we can sometimes understand a little bit more about things that are iconic or about the past, but with our present moment as well. One of the things, one of the, like the, the pedagogy that we practice in the museum is um, very much about getting students to look at images and talk about what they see and what it makes them think about before we come in and tell them about it, right? And it's and that that Im that image of the, the, the image of the Haitian earthquake victim, they immediately jump to these questions of like like who's this like who, who's this guy laying on the street? Who is this guy in the painting? Why did that guy deserve to have a painting of him? Yeah. Does the newspaper even name the person that's laying in the street? Because in this case, they're not named. It just says like a victim of the earthquake. Uh -huh. the students the students pick up those threads immediately from the visual material that your works provide to them they don't need to be told that that's what they should be thinking about in relation to these so they're very powerful in that respect Isn't that great? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm also really struck by the fact that it's a children's book in this most recent piece because you know so many people are at home with their kids and you know classroom school isn't open daycare isn't open and so parents are reading more stories and children are flipping through their children's books more than ever yeah. <laughs> and there's something really beautiful too about that continuity in your work with the 
you know, the politics of the domestic and that it is in our, you know, our daily caregiving and, um, you know, a lot of experiences, especially of women, I think, during this time, during lockdown, uh, are being, I think your work is also kind of speaking to and documenting that as I, if I project <laughs> my own view onto it. <laughs> That's wonderful. I mean, this is such an unusual time. Everybody's finding her his way through it and what to do with the time. I'm, I feel very fortunate to be not, uh, I was just reading my kids who got admitted to Harvard. Now they can't, you know, what a big accomplishment and then they can't go or mm -hmm. artists who have uh, major retrospectives that were about to open and then that can't happen. And, so much anticipation and accomplishment that's voided. Of course, that's all secondary to dying and right. being, being ill and in jeopardy of dying. But uh, there's every level of, of uh, disruption and and just managing the unusual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate both of you uh, taking the time to, to add you. You have both been spectacular mm -hmm. um, in in what you've contributed by by uh, bringing your thoughts to it and your knowledge and your experience with students. So that's been great for me. Yeah. It yeah. really is an I, honor to meet you. Absolutely, Joanne. I've been, I work with your with your art so regularly, and and I love it so it's much. It's really great, and and uh, thank you both a very great deal. Thank you for joining us for this installment of Medicine at the Museum.